Hey everyone and welcome to Storytime, my name is Jake and today we are going to be looking at the subreddit r slash malicious compliance, so sit back relax and enjoy some satisfying stories. Armed guard duty with broken shooting arm? Let's do it. So backstory, around the 2013 time frame, I was stationed at a recently shut down US army garrison in South Korea. I was attached to a unit known as United Nations Command Honor Guard, or UNCHG. This was a multinational honor guard with representative military branches from a few different countries all living together. We did ceremonies for all bigwigs that came to the country, as well as armed security for very sensitive buildings on the installation. Those of us in the US Army, along with our South Korea counterparts, were solely responsible for the guard work. I will refrain from using certain buildings by name, as they were highly sensitive buildings requiring a lot of security. They are more like underground bunkers for doomsday situations, with windows and doors painted on to fool any satellites. This is where my story begins. I had broken my hand and arm shortly after arriving in Korea, through faults of my own. I was in a hard cast and was deemed unable to perform armed guard or ceremonies until I healed. So I primarily ran radio checks and did patrolling rounds to catch anyone sleeping on duty. On this particular day, I was supposed to be off duty, but I was awoken by the sergeant of the guard who was also my squad leader. We will call him Sergeant K. He had an M9 with two mags and a pistol belt in hand. Before I can muster the words to explain I'm off, I'm informed that there is someone special in town and we must up the guards count. I try to explain there is no way in hell I can safely pull at armed guard duty with a broken shooting hand and arm. At this point, I was technically considered unqualified for the M9 since I hadn't been to the shooting range for it in months. He tells me, just take it and go by the book. Roger freaking that, sergeant. I was put into a building that has a foot thick vault door made of steel that leads to a protected guard booth. There is another door of equal size that leads to stairs that go to an underground tunnel that leads to a network of conference rooms as well as a large command hub. I've been on duty for around two hours at this station, reading over the standard operating procedure or SOP for this particular hub. I notice the book has a typo that clearly states only visitors that possess X color badge with X level security clearance are permitted access to this facility, when in reality it should have stated only X at minimum level security clearance may access and all colors indicating higher security clearance are allowed access as well. Initiate compliance. In walks this British army general in plain clothes. I ask for military ID to confirm who he is. He responds in good fashion. I shall certainly not have to show you who I am. I calmly state that this is the rule and as I am not accustomed to him, I can't take his word. He finally shows me his access badge, which unfortunately for him is the highest level he's able to get. I show him the book and clearly point he can't access this facility unless he only has X clearance and no higher. The look on his face was almost too much to keep from laughing and breaking composure. He turns brightly red and walks out. I'm sure thinking I'm dim-witted. Ten minutes later, I have a royally ticked off sergeant first class, who is E7, pounding his fist on my ballistic glass window. He is screaming. Open the goddamn door, specialist, before I skull drag you through this window. Now, I've met this man before, and he's typically a nice guy and helpful. But he's just found out I refused the British Army envoy access to the command meeting. This particular sergeant is the paper jockey for the four star general of the entire Korean peninsula and Asian theater. He has been sent by the general's orders to adjust me. I ask to see this sergeant's security access before I open the door to get skull dragged. Unfortunately for him, the book says he needs X and he has higher than X, so I refused. About 20 minutes later, I have the entirety of my command staff in the room with me screaming and hollering, threatening to chapter me out for disobedience. 
I calmly ask to explain my actions and the circumstances. The sergeant from earlier arrives just in time for the explanation. He is still beet red and fuming to high heck. I open the book in pointer air and tell him I went by the book as ordered to by Sergeant K and the book states that only X was allowed and as stupid and ridiculous as it sounds, the book says anyone with a higher clearance was not authorized. The looks around this tiny room are of hysteria and defeat. The first one to laugh is this ticked off sergeant from earlier who took the book and trashed it in the burn box and walked out. My CO and XO and PL spent that night typing a new SOP for all gut stations, and Sergeant K was confined to pulling 24 hour guard shifts every other day for the week as punishment for making an unqualified and physically incapable shooter pull an armed guard shift, and I was exempt from guard duty until the cast came off. I've never been in the army or anything, so I don't know how strict it is, but surely if he said like, oh yeah, I'll just ignore the book and I'll, I'll do this own order because you've got a higher clearance, then he'd have been punished for not following his rules and being disobedient or something, I don't know. You want to insist I have your kid on my team? Fine. This is my friend's story, with his permission. He coaches a community rep team, travel between cities, that is a development program for placing players in the professional and semi-professional leagues in Europe. Players also end up in universities around North America. He is a top ranked coach. He is also a high school teacher who coaches his school team. Both these points are germane to the story. I won't mention the sport as it could identify him. This past summer, he took his rep team to Europe for both the cultural experience as well as the opportunity to showcase his players for the scouts by playing against local teams. The trip went well but didn't yield any offers for any of the players. It was not his fault but some of the players and their parents blamed him. When they returned home, two of the players quit his team and ghosted him. No explanation, no apologies, they just quit and went to another team. September rolled around, and as it happens, the two players who quit are also students in the high school where he teaches. Now, unlike in some places, high school coaching where I live is volunteer and done in addition to being a full-time teacher. There is no stipend, no time in lieu, no reduced teaching load. If you coach, you do it because of your love of the game and your willingness to mentor young players. So, he agreed to coach and held team tryouts. Sure enough, the two boys who quit his team showed up for tryouts. He told them both he had doubts about their commitment to the team after what they did this summer. They went anyway, but due to his doubts about their commitment and dedication, didn't make the team. The parents hit the roof. They insisted that he was being vindicative and unfair. They accused him of playing favorites. They said it was all about his ego. They went to his principal and to the superintendent. They threatened to bring a complaint against him for professional misconduct to the regulatory body that oversees teachers. They demanded he take the boys on his team. In the face of pressure, he agreed. The boys were added to the roster. Then, he quit the coaching team. The principal tried to convince him otherwise, but he said he could not coach a team under duress from parents. And, as coaching is a voluntary activity, he cannot be forced to do it. The result? The principal could not find another teacher to agree to coach as no one wanted to be seen as a backstabber. So, you guessed it, the team folded. That kind of sucks for like everyone else on the team. I don't know how many other people would be there, but all of those other people that don't get to do it anymore. I really hope they found out why that happened and it was because of those two. When the new boss keeps telling us to follow the rules or suffer the consequences. I work in waste in a large public building and we have a team of about 10 lads who each service up to nine rooms with four huge half ton bins in each. It's often messy work and it's a struggle to attract workers, so the guys that remain are often reliable and very hardworking. 
It being a public service also means the lads will work above and beyond what they're supposed to, as it saves money. We're also on near minimum wage for hauling this stuff through 8 miles of walking each shift. So last year a new boss arrives, immediately starts questioning the way everything works. That's fine, she's here to learn and might bring in new ideas. However, soon she begins to point fingers at good workers and complain about costs. Some of these guys are giving an extra hour or more a week and their efforts just weren't up to her ideals. We start to think she's trying to find problems so as to cut staff. We get virtually no funding and equipment is always faulty. One day, one of the lads goes into the men's changing room to go for a pee sits on a seat to tie his shoelaces and she walks in. No announcement, no chaperone. It's in the rules that she has to be accompanied by a senior male member of the staff to protect her as much as any staff member. Lad put on disciplinary. Another day, another lad, pushing a noisy trolley of equipment, gets pulled for making too much noise try to explain it's not our responsibility to repair the equipment and we have no control over the noise it makes. We still have to get the job done. Disciplinary. Another day, a non-waste member of the public jumps into our lift, refuses to leave. Boss sees, disciplines lad for letting member of the public in there. So we all decide to have a little chat in private and to stop doing free time, stop rushing and refuse to use faulty equipment on safety grounds. The place ground to a halt within two days, with people phoning the boss, asking why the heck wasn't the rubbish taken, to which she calls a meeting and starts asking angry questions. Slowly, she starts to realize that she's caused this and that isn't going to be fixed with her shouting down guys and being a witch. A few weeks pass and we end up with another meeting. She now has put forward a new contract and asked us all to sign over to worse conditions and less money, as the department is in dire financial problems. Not our problem. Go to government and complain. So, now we've all had our overtime taken away, with the time being offered to an agency. Agency lads have refused to come as they don't like messy work. She doesn't understand that they get to choose, and that work isn't being done again. She now has to learn that we understand our rights as well as our responsibilities, and that she has some responsibilities herself. That's definitely just someone who works in management all their life, maybe has a degree in management and they have no idea the ins and outs of the business. It's so stupid, like just take some time to learn what's going on first. A long time ago, in a call center far, far away. Our settings. Number one, a call center in Canada, run by a company, we'll change the name to protect the very guilty, SH Monverges. And number two, a home in Texas. Our setup, it's the early 2000s, a cable TV and broadband internet company named BT&T. Rather than having its own employees answer the phone, instead contracts out to SH Monverges. We do password resets, internet troubleshooting and scheduling service calls and upgrades and downgrades. Our characters, me. Q, plucky young college student who works his evenings and weekends to pay for school. And C, the caller, a man who gets what he wants. Our story. The caller calls in. He's just been installed, but of course, he has no idea how to set up anything and the installer does nothing. Just gets him to sign and then bolts. We used to call it the drive-by cable modeming. I walk him through the setup, the online registration, and now he has to put in his primary email address and password. This is set up by the person who originally took his order. Your username will be XXYX. No, that's wrong. It should be XXXX. It's a small spelling mistake that was likely made by the original order rep. But there's a foible in the system. Once you get the primary, it can't be changed. We'd escalated repeatedly through our supervisors, managers, general managers. All had been told, 
This is how it works. We're not changing it. We're not fixing it for customers. They get another eight email accounts that they can custom, so no big deal. Or at least it normally is. As I explain the system limitation and explain that he can still set up the other emails and just use this one only to set up the account and later add emails, he digs in. You need to fix it. Unfortunately, as I explained due to the limitations of our system, it cannot be adjusted, but this will not impact the other 8 email accounts on your internet connection in the slightest. But I'm paying for 9 email accounts. Fix it. This is not really accurate. As far as BT&T is concerned, email is pro bono. It's the connection you pay for. But I don't want to anger him. As I've explained, and I do apologize, but this is a limitation of the system and it cannot be corrected. Well, if you can't fix a small problem like this, then I want to cancel my service. And hangs up. My eyes lit up and a smile parted my lips. It's time for the malicious compliance because we've been told repeatedly we had to honor the customer's requests. Unless it was illegal or against the rules, we had to do it. So I did. I closed his brand new account that he'd just been installed with. And look at that. I can have a tech out to his home tomorrow to cut the hard line, as required. Shame because I know it's at least a one to two week wait for the install, I know he'll want. But I want to make sure I'm 100% compliant, so I leave a long, glorious detailed note in his account. Notes that are so long it takes two entries to get them all in, ending with well, if you can't fix a small problem like this, then I want to cancel my service. The bonus round came about six months later. I'm not the type to stalk an account to gloat. You come in, I help you, and then I let it roll off my back. I get called. As I'm helping this very cooperative caller, I check the notes. It's C. His disconnection happened. He called back, uttering all kinds of threats and admonitions, but apparently got very quiet when they read my notes to him. Well, if you can't fix a small problem like this, then I want to cancel my service. It took three weeks for him to get reconnected because we weren't going to bump anyone for this. Not when my crystal clear notes laid everything out that we were just following his request. Oh, and it cost him another $50 to sign up for the second install. I wonder if he got the email address that he wanted, because if so, that's, that's a nice loophole right there. I guess it does cost $50 to do so, but at least he gets the right thing. Hey everyone, I hope you all had a really good day and that you enjoyed that video. If you want to check out some other videos, then click on screen right now, or check out the playlist down below. If you enjoyed that video, then please do leave a like, and if you want to submit your own stories, then you can do so by joining the Discord in the top link in the description. But thank you so much for watching, and I will see you very soon.